Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had a really remarkable, and I even say memorable, kickoff of our Global Policy Forum. Now we do have a lot on the table to discuss. We're going to do this in three different panels and some keynote speeches before the closing remarks of the Secretary General of the OECD, Matthias Karman. And the starting point of our discussion today is the buzzword. You heard it from uh, Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni. The invasion of Russia and Ukraine is a game changer, not just of the international security architecture, but we already heard about the severe shortages in fuel and food of the refugee, the humanitarian crisis, and what the international community can do trying to restore not just peace, but also to mitigate the impact of this crisis. This is what we're going to discuss here in, on the Bocconi stage with Oksana Pokalchuk. Welcome. She is the director of Amnesty International in uh, Ukraine, a lawyer, a human rights activist. It's a pleasure having you here in Milan. And Thomas Gomart, who is director of the French Institute of International Relations. Gassan Salamé, professor of international relations at Science Po. And he was the previous senior advisor of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And Susan Shirk. Susan Shirk is chair of the 21st Century China Center of the University of California in uh, San Diego. So let me start in terms of the international community, its role. Salam, uh, Gassan uh, uh, Salame, my first point is for you, because when we think at the player on the ground, not just from a military standpoint, but from a diplomatic standpoint, the main forces, where is the United Nations? We know that the Security Council is kind of stalled today, but do you think that it could have some more space, some space in the future to maneuver, to be one of the players of the solution of this crisis? No, very frankly, I don't think so. Uh, it has been the case since the creation of the United Nations in 1945 that when a, a member of the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council, has been directly involved in a conflict, it was almost impossible for the Security Council itself to get involved because the veto would be raised immediately by the country concerned. This was the case during the colonial wars with Britain and France. This was the case with Russia in different places, including Georgia and Ukraine in 2014, and was the case also with China when it came uh, to Tibet. So when a P5 member, when a veto-yielding power is involved, the Security Council is paralyzed. This time, on top of that, the Secretary General was himself paralyzed. Putin would not meet him in Beijing on the margin of the uh, Olympics. Zelensky was not very happy either. Putin would take time in order to receive him along this huge table uh, like other visitors he had. Uh, he was not very kind uh, to him. So neither the Security Council nor the Secretary General were in a good position to start negotiations. So what we do? My uh, advice is what I call to maintain and contain. First, to contain. We need to contain the Ukraine war in itself and for itself. The Security Council cannot do much about it. The Secretary General cannot do much about it, but let's contain it. Let's not have it infect the whole international system and the other conflicts. Let's contain it as much as we can in what it is, so that the Security Council, uh, especially with countries that are now associated, like Russia and China, can still operate on other formula, other conflicts, appointing special representative of the Security Council, including one to succeed me in, 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 uh, in Libya or to succeed my colleague uh, in Afghanistan, who is leaving this week, uh, trying to find uh, a number uh, of agreements on other conflicts that are in particular, I would say, we need a Security Council resolution to keep feeding the three or four million refugees in northwest Syria, and for that we need to cooperate with the Chinese and the Russians 
on that. Yeah. So my proposal, let's contain the Ukrainian conflict despite its huge importance and let's maintain cooperation with China and Russia on other things that are not related directly to Ukraine, where the Security Council can do it. Contain and maintain, these are the first key words we are hearing here. But Thomas Gommert, we already also saw on our video clip introducing the debate, Russia is kind of a paria state today. The invasion, with the invasion, Putin has isolated completely Russia from the international community and also from an economic standpoint. We already heard today all the consequences of this. How do you look at the future of the relation between Europe and Russia if there will be a kind of a form of relation in the future? First of all, let me thank uh, ISP and um, University Bocconi and uh, OCDE for their kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. To go to, to, your, to your question, uh, I would like maybe to, to remind that um, this war did not start, you know, on the 24th of February. Uh, this war started eight years ago with the annexation of Crimea and the uh, separatists directly supported by um, Moscow eight years ago. And sanctions were taken already by uh, the EU uh, uh, at that time. So it, it's, it's important to, to, to have this, um, this timeline in, in mind to try to anticipate what uh, could happen in the, in the coming uh, months or, or, or years. At the time being, the main consequences are for um, sure, first of all, for Ukraine, which uh, suffers dramatically from casualties. It's now a broken country to some extent. The situation for Russia is the fact that Russia has been disconnected, disconnected uh, from the Western side of globalization. But the point is that there are other sides of uh, globalization. And uh, for Europe, the main consequence is the fact that Europe as a continent uh, lost its main uh, competitive advantage, which was a peaceful continent um, uh, by comparison with other regions in, um, in the world. So that, that leads indeed to um, a, a few observations regarding the current situation between the EU and Russia. Uh, you know, I started my career at E3 uh, already uh, two decades ago, and I, I spent many times to cover, for instance, the summit between the EU and Russia. I remind you that we had two uh, summits each year uh, until 2014, until the uh, annexation, annexation of, of Crimea. I remind, you know, a lecture at the College of Europe in, uh, in Gimo, for instance. So that's that's unfortunately the past now, because uh, I think that uh, uh, Russia, as I said, is, is dis disconnected for, for, many, for many years, for the next uh, decade, um, at least, uh, I would say. Uh, it's not a situation uh, similar to the one uh, we are during the Cold War, for two main reasons. Uh, at the, at, during the Cold War, there was a competition, confrontation, which was ideological and a military comp uh, competition. Uh, but you had, during the Cold War, uh, intellectual, scientific, cultural links, which was, by the way, promoted, encouraged by the West to try to, to make the USSR and uh, its allies uh, changing. And the big change is, is, in fact, that we are in a worse situation right now because we are in a military con confrontation, we are in an ideological mm -hmm. confrontation, but we cut all types of uh, links. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's explained by the magnitude of the, of the Russian uh, aggression, but also the magnitude of the sanctions taken to, to react uh, will uh, continue for a while, it, as it was said rightly, I think, uh, during the, 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 the first decision. The problem we have is, in fact, that uh, the Kremlin, the current leadership in the Kremlin, Vladimir Vladimirovich, does think that the EU will be uh, on its knees uh, before Russia. That's ma mainly the calculus made uh, in, the, in the Kremlin. And um, more broadly, um, Russia is preparing itself since many years, and in, in a sense it was before 2014, for a world of uh, autarky. Uh, you have this idea in, uh, in Russia that the pressure on resources 
the competition between powers will increase dramatically, and consequently, uh, Russia should be able to have a much more uh, autarchic uh, um, economy or a system. That's uh, the Kremlin's choice. It can be seen as uh, completely misleading from a Western point of view for people who uh, believe so strongly into globalization, but that's basically the orientation taken by the Kremlin since uh, many years and uh, which has been accelerated with uh, this war um, in Ukraine. Uh, yeah. Last point, I think that the dramatic, uh, cons the, the main consequence at the time being uh, between the EU and Russia is related to the uh, inversion of the energy model. To put things very bluntly, um, Italy started to import, you know, oil from uh, USSR in 1958. Uh, Europeans take gas uh, from the USSR at the beginning of the 80s, and our energy system was basically to, to take uh, mm -hmm. re energy resources from the east and from the global south. And now, in a very short period of time, we are asked as Europeans to transfer the, to inverse, sorry, the model and to take energy from the West, from the US, which is now uh, a net exporter of energy, and from the global source. And it will be very, very difficult to ac accomplish that given, you know, the economic crisis, the environmental crisis, and for sure the military crisis. I yeah. stop there. And, and it is, and it is difficult indeed. Now, let me, Oksana Pogac, let me get back to Ukraine and the situation on the ground, because in his address, President Zelensky asked again to the European, to the European Union for weapons, for finance support, for starting to think at the rebuilding of the country. But what, what, which are, in your view, the most urgent needs of the people in Ukraine, based on what you do on the ground? Yeah, thank you for this question. I'm Ukrainian myself, and our organization we work from the very beginning of this full-scale war in Ukraine, so we investigate situation very closely from the ground, and um, it's hard to answer this question in short. But I, I would um, address two issues. First is the issue of uh, basic needs. So a lot of people from eastern and south part of Ukraine, they were forced to leave their homes and flee into other regions uh, inside Ukraine. In accordance with the UN, it's up to 7 million people who now are internally displaced people. So this, all of them, they need work, they need medical support, they need housing. Moreover, we we have to raise the issue of IDPs who are in need and in poverty. And for them, uh, the question of basic medicine might be a question of survival. Uh, so for all of these 7 million of people, the main question is winter. Because winter is, in Ukraine is cold. And now our government, they built temporary buildings for IDPs in Ukraine, but it's not enough. They, are, they don't have heating system. And the big question, where the seven millions of people will spend this winter? Uh, second issue, of course, the question of security. Because every day, uh, Ukrainian people suffering from rocket attacks and missiles from Russian territory and from territory of seas. I don't know if you saw it, I know we are not in the news now, but every day, every single day, we get attacks from Russia. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think yeah. so far it's for. Yeah, that's very interesting. We'll get back to mm -hmm. that in a minute, because uh, as you know, have been mentioned also the relation between Russia and China. With this, I want to move to uh, Susan Shirk, because you know that Putin met with Xi Jinping ahead of the Winter Olympic. Now, Susan Scher, do you think that he unveiled his plan to China before, a month before, ahead of starting the invasion? And do you think, why do you think that Xi Jinping, President Xi, is again sidelining and supporting in a way uh, President Putin now? Well, thank you so much to ISPI, Bakoni University, Think20 Indonesia, and the OECD for giving me the opportunity to participate, even though, unfortunately, 
I can't be there with you in person. Uh, of course, we don't know what happened in the private conversation between Putin and Xi Jinping. But it's interesting that U.S. senior officials, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, uh, gave Xi Jinping the benefit of the doubt when he said that he suspected that Putin had not revealed the full extent of his plans to invade the Ukraine, which of course gave Xi Jinping the opportunity to distance himself, to criticize the invasion, mm. and to especially not support it. But instead, Xi Jinping opted to, uh, to act as if Putin was his friend and the United States was his enemy uh, in that he very much uh, sided with Putin uh, regardless of what he had actually been told. He didn't condemn the invasion. He didn't uh, stand with Ukraine, which is one of China's uh, major trading partners. Uh, but uh, fortunately, he also did not tangibly assist Russia in its war in Ukraine, which uh, as a practical matter is probably the most important thing. Thank you for that. I'll get back to Gassan Salame. Gassan Salame, you've been also the UN special representative to Libya. You know very well the situation on the ground. And my question is, how do you see the implication of the war in the Middle East on one hand with Syria, for example, and also in Libya and in the northern part of Africa? Look, I, I don't believe that the difficulties, uh, the Russian uh, aggression uh, in Ukraine is encountering is going to affect in a radical way the Russian involvement elsewhere. Russia is very active in Syria, has been successful in uh, protecting the regime of Bashar al-Assad, has been crucial since uh, 2015 in doing that, and will be crucial in probably containing the Turkish attempt to create a cordon sanitaire on the border between Turkey and Syria, which Erdogan himself announced two weeks ago. In Libya, it's different. In Libya, in fact, the, uh, the Russian uh, mercenary company, Wagner, has been beaten, has been beaten by, by, by the Turkish army and by uh, the uh, western part of, of, of Libya, and they had to flee uh, under, uh, under a counterattack. Therefore, they had their difficulty. They also had difficulties in getting paid by uh, Marshal Haftar. They also had difficulty in paying themselves their uh, Syrian subcontractors because they had brought two to three thousand Syrian subcontractors to help them in Libya. So Wagner is having its own difficulties long before uh, the Ukraine war has started. Now. It is also true that the whole world is now vying for those countries across the world, including in the Middle East, uh, who are not aligned truly with neither Russia nor the West in this uh, Ukrainian war. So both the West and Russia need the votes of those countries in the Middle East. The West in particular needs the gas and the oil of this part uh, of the world. And also, uh, they need money from the oil money-making countries in order to help those countries like Egypt, Lebanon, Senegal, who cannot pay for double price wheat because of the food crisis. Uh, and also, you have the issue of refugees. While Western Europe has to deal with refugees from Ukraine, Nobody in Europe wants a new wave of refugees across North Africa and in particular across, across Libya. Therefore, the centrality of the uh, uh, European theater, which has been the dogma of the Cold War and is still to a large extent mm -hmm. a dogma, should not hide the fact that there are other conflicts 
uh, in which Russia and China are directly involved, and they haven't stopped getting involved only because Russia is so involved in the Ukrainian war. Uh, Thomas Kumar, what do you think that, having said that the UN is stalled, as uh, Gaston Salamé told us today, what can the international community do to accelerate a diplomatic solution, kind of a negotiate of the crisis? And what's the role that you think France, and it's also President Macron, it's a kind of a special day today after, you know, the, the vote and the election. How do you see the role that France can play looking ahead? Look, I, I, I think, you know, that um, it will be very difficult at the time being to, to turn the tide, to be honest. I'm afraid that, you know, it's, it's only depend on the military situation on the field and the level of support, you know, uh, given to, to the Ukrainian people to continue their, their existential fight. In fact, you know, we are facing, uh, in my opinion, a colonial war led by Russia under a nuclear cover. So to, to, to respond directly to your question, this nuclear dimension is very present in the French uh, mindsets since uh, to 24th of February. I have no time to elaborate on that, but it is something uh, very consistent in the, in the, to, to explain in the, 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 the French policy. Now, two things to be avoided, maybe. The very first one is, is you know, when you deal with Russia, Russia does not consider that diplomacy means the end of uh, warfare. Russia combined all the time warfare and diplomacy. And in the West, you know, uh, we have the, this, um, this habitude to, to think that diplomacy, that means uh, stopping warfare. So let's, let's be very, very careful when we are speaking about diplomatic process regarding the situation uh, uh, on the ground. The second thing related to, to, to France, you know, there was many uh, attempts, you know, during the, uh, the before before 24th of February last week. There is this uh, trip made by uh, the leaders from Romania, Italy, Germany, uh, uh, and France. I think that what is expected from France right now is maybe to to, to continue to be consistent on three main points. The very first one is to remind that uh, we are facing as European a very deep and quick degradation of uh, our neighborhood, of our joint neighborhood. And it is a point made by Paris since many years uh, with different perception in uh, other European capital. Now we are all, I would say, on the same line. Second, I think it's very important for France to clarify and to say that we don't fight against the Russian people. We fight against Putin's regime, mm -hmm. and we stand with uh, Ukraine and with uh, Ukrainian uh, people. And last yeah. point, I think that what is uh, expected from uh, from Paris, it is to, to, to consider that we need to prepare the next um, organization within the EU, with the, certainly the next phase of enlargement, but also to, to try to find ways to, to, uh, to deal with uh, uh, countries which, which are candidate or countries which are not candidate to the EU, and to be able at the same time to interact with the US, but also without the US, because there is a, a huge um, ellipsis in our discussion, which is, is the uh, US future positioning. Imagine the situation, you know, last February yeah. with uh, Donald Trump in the White House, for instance. Mm. Now, Oksana Pokalchuk, there's also another angle talking uh, human rights, which is war crimes. And in May, there was the first trial for war crimes since the beginning of the invasion. How do you see the role that international car courts could have to, uh, you know, to restore justice? And what could hamper the role of international courts looking ahead? Good question. Yeah, first of all, I want to say that, in my opinion, the whole processes and mechanism have to be as comprehensive as possible, as first of all. And uh, it is important for all of us, you know, to, to, to support the system and to support existing mechanism and to address uh, the war crimes um, into that institutions. But what can hamper? I would rather uh, address two points. First, and it's obvious that Russia will uh, continue to, I don't know, to not to cooperate uh, in this process. So they will reject to extradite suspects, uh, people who are suspected or accused of war crimes or things mm -hmm. like this, and uh, these people will never face the justice. Um, and 
it doesn't mean that we have to stop it and not to continue doing it because it's it's a question of international justice and it's a question for justice for innocent victims, innocent killed civilians in Ukraine, which are waiting, waiting for this um, for this moment when, when when the decision will be will be taken. And the second and very important issue for me is what my hamper is inability for international community to develop strong uh, judicial mechanism to address the question of crime of aggression itself. It's uh, quite a new challenge for the whole system, world system, I know. And there's a lot of bureaucracy around it. And there are a lot of ways how we can decide our, how Ukraine can go, uh, which might be seen much more easier. But the idea, I think now for all of us, and the biggest challenge for all of us is now that it's a moment when all of us, we can develop a strong new institution that will work not only for Ukraine and because mm -hmm. of the Ukrainian conflict, but we will be able to address many other uh, crimes of aggression or situations similar to this. And maybe it will be the first step towards new reality without yeah. wars. Yeah, this should be at the center of the building of a new world order. And uh, absolutely, we have to wrap up our panel session. Let me ask a final question to uh, Susan Shirk. And the question is again on the relation or partnership between uh, Russia and China. How do you see the evolution of this partnership and how should the West look at this? From the standpoint of Western countries in Europe and the United States, it's, it would really be disastrous to find ourselves in another Cold War or even hot war that could potentially go nuclear between ourselves and an alliance of Russia and China. We're actually very close to that now. Uh, Russia and China, uh, in particular, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, uh, have a strong affinity for one another, mainly because they both feel threatened, in particular, by the United States. Uh, they're focused on their zero-sum contest with the United States, which brings them closer together. They're worried about color revolutions. Their own legitimacy as autocratic leaders is, uh, leads them to feel quite insecure. And this brings them closer together. So it seems pretty obvious to me that an important part of the strategy of Western nations should be not to drive them closer together. And in particular, well, to give each of them, but especially China, which hasn't invaded another country, uh, to the opportunity to restore decent relations with the West. Uh, we shouldn't make it more difficult for China to make some compromises to negotiate issues of dispute with Europe and with the United States that might help uh, restore some goodwill in the relationship. So uh, some people would call this a wedge strategy. I have no problems with calling it a wedge strategy. Yes, we should design a strategy that uh, preserves our own uh, national security and our competitiveness by seeking not to drive China closer to Russia, but giving China a kind of off-ramp to uh, restore better relations with the United States and with Europe. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Thanks again to Susan Shirk and uh, Thomas Komar, uh, uh, Gassan Salame, and Oksana Pokalchuk. Uh, thank you so much.